says he's the abundant supply. Only he understands what you and I go through. Sometimes you can't even explain how you feel. You don't even know how you feel. But the word says he knows. He's touched by the feelings of our infirmities, which is our weaknesses and our shortcomings and our faults and our failures and all the other things that go on. That's why we say our God is an awesome God. He is worthy to be praised. All day yesterday, it seemed like all day long, that just kept coming into my spirit. Our God's an awesome God. Several things I had to do yesterday, and one obstacle after another, but you know, I just kept thinking, my God's an awesome God. I kept declaring, my God's an awesome God. I'd sing, my God's an awesome God. I'd just speak it out. It's going to come out of my spirit. And it's amazing that even though obstacles come, God knows how to move them. And I know we got time this morning. We come to worship. I'm going to preach in a minute. But I'm not going to get ahead of God. That's not worth the effort to do that. Just to be able to do something. But I want to say part of that song, our God's an awesome God, this morning. I just feel we need to we just need to sing that. Does anybody believe he's an awesome God? If we believe that, and I know we do because we just said we did, I think this would be a time that you can just get with God, just do him for just a few minutes. And out of your heart, sing this to him as if you was looking him right in the face. And you tell him, God, you're an awesome God. Because you don't know what you're going to face this week. You made it last week. Hallelujah. Then he thought he'd take you out. He didn't do it. You're here. He said you'll never make it. But you did. He said there's no hope. But there is. Why? Because my God's an awesome God. Sometimes I feel like shouting. Sometimes I feel like crying. Sometimes I feel like just standing in His presence. And just feel the warmth of His love. Just tell him from my innermost being, you're an awesome God. And it's you that I trust. Will you join us and lift your voices and say that this morning? Sister? Thank you, Lord.
And Lord, the only way a church is going to be able to come out of me is what you pull out by the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would anoint the ears of the hearer to hear, the heart to receive, the mind to understand and comprehend. That these are indeed the last days, and you are indeed the great God of heaven and earth. You are the awesome God who is working in our behalf, preparing us for the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've talked about it, we've sung about it, we've prayed about it. We've discussed it day in and day out for years and years, but I believe without any doubt that day is fast approaching. That we're going to hear that sound in that eastern sky of that trumpet that's going to raise the dead. That's going to change us from the mortal to the immortal for the glory of God. And we'll spend an eternity with you, Lord. Lord, but it's going to have to be that we're faithful unto the end. We're going to have to be about the kingdom work. We've got to be about the Father's business. Lord, I know there's much to distract us, there's much to pull us away. Lord, that's the life we live in. It's such a fast pace. But still, in the midst of all of this, we need you like we've never needed you before. So help us, I pray, to strengthen us and direct us that you would speak to our hearts this day. I bind every spirit of hell, every force of darkness, every influence of we not of God. And I speak over this congregation and this people alertness. I speak over them, Father God, comprehension of the word. And it may set in our heart for a seed in us that will change us. Glory to glory, they line up on my precept upon precept. In Jesus' name we pray. Yes, amen. 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 You know, I'm convinced everybody should enjoy life to the fullest. Every day that you get up, you ought to be just happy to get up. Someone told me one time, what a bad day this happened. I said, try this one. You think you have a bad day now? I said, because I, your worst day that you have is still a good day any way you approach it. And in the life that you and I live in, you know, we have to make a decision each and every day that we get up. Either we're going to live right or we're going to live wrong. Either we're going to do what we know God wants us to do, or we're going to listen to what the world says and find ourselves going down avenues that we do not need to go down. In fact, it will take you down places you don't need to go and keep you longer than you want to stay there. In fact, that you wake up one day and realize, how did I get in this shit and how did I get in this mess? But we have to understand that our adversary is out to destroy us. But I'll tell you what, God's out to help us this morning. Yes. And I'm glad to know that he is still in charge. Everything is still okay. He still sits on the throne. Everything is going to work out. It's the way he said it worked. No matter what people think, say. No matter what people print. No matter what people put on television. No matter what we legislate. It's going to work out just like God said. And even though people say, well, I just don't believe that. There's going to come a day that the unbeliever is going to have the most stark reality that's ever hit them in their life. When they're going to realize one day that must have been the truth. I thought to myself when I was thinking along those lines, how many people does Noah was building in the ark? They said, well, that's crazy. It's never rained here. He's building a big old boat out here in the middle of nowhere. This man's insane. He's lost his mind. For 120 years he told them they didn't believe. They wouldn't listen. But I'm telling you, when the old thunder began to sound, the lightning began to flash, the rain began to fall, all of a sudden that unbelief suddenly become faith. And they said, we need to go to the ark and get on with God and not shut the door. And I'm telling you, we're living in a day and a time that's along that same avenue to think about because the Word of God says that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the end. And I believe without any doubt that you will look at the society that we live in and we begin to see what the Scripture said about Noah. You begin to compare them. And it's almost like a blueprint of what's already happening. We're just completely redoing what's been done. And I'm telling you, the Lord said there's going to come a day that I'm going to say it's enough. I'm going to tell my son to go get my church. And I believe that you and I who are here today, I believe most of us will be living when the rapture of the church takes place. It's not just something we're going to have to think about anymore or talk about or sing about, but it's something we're going to enjoy. And I'm telling you, when it takes place, I think we're going to have some surprise looks on our faces as we leave this world to the world yet to come, but not near as surprised as the people who are left behind who are going to say it really must have been just what they said it was. And I began to think along those lines, and I, uh, the Lord began to take me to these four lepers men. And he began to talk about the situation in Samaria where they were shut up in the city, they were starving to death, and how that uh, the food was eaten, how they got to the place that they was eating donkey heads. And I've never tried a donkey head, but I've just got a feeling it's pretty tough. And I'm sure there's not a whole lot of meat on it. You could probably boil it or something like that, but that'd be about the end of that. And it said not only with that, but they was eating, uh, uh, also eating a dove dung, which, you know, that's the waste of a dove. That just, uh, I just can't see those two things being of any value to you. But that's how hungry they were. You know, it's kind of like those saying is if you, people talk about, I don't like this, I don't like that, I won't eat this, I won't eat that. You've never really been hungry. 
If you're hungry, you'd be surprised what you'll eat if you're on the verge of starvation. In fact, the scripture tells us, in fact, just a little bit before this, it says that the women eat their children. Now think about that just a little bit. Cannibalism began to take place in the city. The king was at his rope's end. He didn't know what to do. The woman come to him and said, King, help me, help me if you can. He said, what can I do? She said, he said, what do you need? What's going on? Talk about eating their children. How he rent his clothes and set in sackcloth and began to pray. And the prophet God had already told them what was going to happen. You see, that's why when men and women stand in the pulpit and preach what does say the word of God, I'm not talking about a sugar-coated message. I'm not talking about something that's warm and fuzzy. I'm not talking about something to make you feel good so you can skip out of church and say, ooh, look how good that was. But I'm talking about something that will penetrate your heart. I'm talking something to get your spirit. Something that will turn you upside down. That will make you find you an altar somewhere. And you'll pray and begin to seek the face of God. Well, there will be a yearning and a hunger after righteousness again. That's what I'm talking about. That kind of message. Something that somebody will use to tell you thus saith the word of God. Tell you the truth. That's what Elisha did. He was telling them what was about to happen. But I thought, isn't it amazing? But even when you read about that, how that the king and his, uh, his leader said, oh, that's never going to happen. But how God showed that it would be just as God said it would be. That's amazing, isn't it? And God uses the most inopportune things to us to accomplish His plan. We think we'll get it all figured out sometime. Well, that's going to be this way. It's going to be that way. But it's amazing how God takes things and changes them to the point that when He works the way He works, we sit back and all say, well, I never thought He would do it that way. Nobody knows how God's going to do it. I'm just convinced God's going to do it. I don't have to figure it out. I don't always have to know every little thing that happens. All I've got to do is trust in my faith and declare the word of the Lord over every situation of our lives. When I think about these four lepers, the word of God says they were sitting outside the gate and so they were sitting there uh, outside of a city that was already starving. They were sitting there dying because they were leprous men. They weren't allowed to be with the regular people. And said, as a result of them sitting there and asking the question, why sit we here if we die? One of them finally had the light go on. Today they sit standing here. What are we doing this far? In the city there's family, we go in there. I mean, they're already without food. We'll die in there. If we sit here, we're going to die. You know, what are we going to do? He said, well, let's at least get up and go down and fall upon our enemy. Let's go down to their camp. If they kill us, what have we got to lose? We're going to die anyway. If we die today, we die tomorrow. But just perhaps, just maybe, they might have a little pity on us because we're no threat. I mean, we're not soldiers. We're not warriors. We're poor, leprous men that are sick and nobody wants anything to do with us. I thought, isn't it amazing how that in the world in which you and I live, how that the world has kind of taken Christianity and treated us like poor, leprous men. How that, what can they do? They have no power. They have no authority. And sad part about it is so many times the church has lost its power because we have taken God out of the forefront of what needs to be happening in our life. We just use Him as we need Him. We use Him just for a quick fix or a little touch. But I'm telling you, God wants to have a relationship with us seven days a week, 365 days a year. Every moment, every second, He wants you to pray and seek Him and talk to Him and meditate upon Him because in so doing, He will change your life and He will change mine. Finally, they decided, we've got to do something. You know, the amazing thing, people talk about insanity. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing you've done last year and expecting a different result. It's not going to happen. You're going to have the same result year after year, day after day, month after month after month, and you keep doing the same thing. But you've got to do something different. I have no control of my life. I can't control what comes in and what goes out. I can't control what I have to deal with. But yet, I serve one who is in control. He knows everything there is about me. That's why we talk about living by faith. It's easy to live by faith when you don't have to do anything. But when you got to walk by faith, when you got to stand, when you can't see anything, any hope, any way out, any way that's just going to be solved, but by faith, I'm going to stand on the word. I'm going to declare I am the redeemed of the Lord. God, this is your promise. It's your word. You said you would do it. I can't do anything about it. You said do all that I can do when I've done all I can do. Stand and see the salvation. I'm standing, God. What do you want to do? They said, let's get up and do something. They said, well, okay. Let's do that. You see, they were one mind, one accord. Amen. They got tired of sitting on the premises. They got tired of talking about all the things they should do and could do and would do. And they got up and did something. I thought, how many times do we in the church we'll talk about, we need to do this and this and this. 
We should do this and this and this. If we did this and this and this, this might make a difference. But what good does talking do if we don't put some feet and prayers on that talking? If we don't take it before the Lord and give it to Him, say, Lord, now, you give us some instruction, you lead us and guide us what we need to do, and everything's going to work out pretty good. And so we begin to do that. Where did God say these men got up and sent off down to the camp? Little did they know that even though they were lepers, they were dying, they weren't welcome in the city. Nobody cared anything about them. But God was going to use them to be heroes. You see, God is always looking for somebody who will say, Here I am, Lord, use me. They had no idea that what they were fixing to do was going to change the situation. They were just having to deal with whole number one. You know the biggest problem I have is number one. I have to deal with me all the time. And so they started off down and they had no idea what was about to happen. But the Word of God says that the Lord got in their arrangements. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm telling you when the Lord gets in their arrangements, everything changes. These four old men, sick, probably bandaged up. You've ever seen pictures of people with leprosy? Maybe had some fingers missing, maybe had some toes missing. Maybe the nose here, who not but stuff all along when you have leprosy folks. And I can almost see them in my spirit as they begin to go off down that road, maybe dragging a foot, limping, propped up on a, a walking stick. I mean, who knows? Bandaging over one eye. But they kept thinking, maybe they'll have more sins. Maybe they'll have fees. Maybe, 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 maybe. They were speaking their faith and didn't even know it. You know, they could sit there all day and talk about, we go down to the camp of Syria and take on feed us and take care of us. We'll just wait till they come to the city and they'll take care of it. Now they could have did something. We as people of God need to do something. And it said that as they started down the road, made that move toward the enemy camp, God began to move in their arrangements and all of a sudden, he took the four members that were walking and they began to amplify their steps. And the people who were their enemy heard not four men walking, but they heard the sound of chariots and horses and foot soldiers. And they began to panic. Whoa, what's going on here? The king of Israel has gone out and hired against us the Hivites and the Egyptians. And they're coming. Listen now. Listen at the Lord. There is so many of them. We, we, we don't know what we're going to do. So they went into instant panic. And they were so afraid that they jumped up out of their tents and ran toward home, didn't take their horses, didn't take their mule, didn't take their tent, didn't take their gold, didn't take their pot, their pan, or anything. They left it land right there. All they were concerned about was getting away. You see, so many times when the enemy comes against you, you've got to make some kind of effort to stop him. You can't just roll over and play dead because he said in the word of God, he's out to destroy, kill, and murder you. You've got to stand against him and declare that my Redeemer liveth. My God is a great God. He's an awesome God. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the outcome's going to be. But I'm going to stand and declare the saith the word of God that the God of heaven is on my side. I'm his friend. I'm the one that has accepted him as Lord and Savior. Now, he's in charge of taking care of me. I'm going to hide in the hall of his hand. I'm going to let him take his wings and cover me up. I'm going to let him put me where I need to be. I'm not going to settle the premises anymore and just talk about what used to be. But I'm going to believe God for what's fixing to happen. You see, it's church. We look at churches sometimes and we talk about how the church used to be. We spend so much time looking behind, we don't look forward. We talk about, oh, I remember when. And I, I love remembering when things. I remember a lot of things that was when. But I'm not interested in that what's going on. I can't do nothing with it. I can't get anything out of it. I enjoyed it while it was there. But that past is just a memory now. I'm interested in what's happening right now. I'm interested in why people don't get saved. I'm interested in why the Holy Ghost is not poured out. I'm interested in why miraculous healings don't take place. I'm wondering why blinded eyes are not open, deaf ears are not open. Because of the simple fact, we as the church, we sat on the premises too long and have not been seeking the promises of God. Where God says they got down, then they took off so fast that they left everything behind. It said when the leper men come into camp, they looked around. We're doing what they 
Well, sing about it. You sing about it? No, I don't sing about it. What about you, George? No. What about over there? Sam? No. I don't sing about it. Well, let's go in the camp and see what's going on there. Right, that's what they're doing. That way, first they're close. Then they're going to us. But let me tell you, when God gets in the arrangements and begins to move, there ain't nothing standing in there. They walked in the first tent. Got a big old turkey to eat. I don't know it's turkey. I'm not that's a message, so I said it's turkey. But it said they went in and got food to eat, so I called it a turkey. And it said they picked up some real nice raiment because you need to think about it. We call leprosy men now. We talk about men who've got little dirty bags, bandaged up. They got some fine threads now. I mean, they put them all they probably strutting around there. Look at here. Look at me, man. I need something. Well, they found a little gold and found a little silver, so that's what happened is before somebody gets it. When in another camp, when the next camp done the same thing, and finally one of them said, thank God there's always somebody got a little sense in the box. He said, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, boy, doing a bad thing here. We're down here picking out, having a good time, living it up, look at us. But if we hang out and keep doing this, by morning, they'll come back. We'll be in trouble. And said, our friends, the people we know, they're starving to death in the city, and we do not do well. They said, well, let's go back. Tell them they went back to the city, knocked on the door, the porter come to the door and said, come on out. They didn't eat. The Syrian's gone. Uh huh, yeah, right. Uh -huh. We know what they're doing. I'll go to the king. The king said, yeah, I know what they're up to. They're hiding out there waiting for us to come out. They're going to take the city. They said, well, I don't know about that. But, but anyway, this, this is what we see. The king said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take old Elisha on a good idea, though. He said, you wait and see. I'll give you what he's done in Elisha. They came down to him. Elisha made this declaration. He said, I'm all right. You can buy flour, you can buy barley, nothing. Now you don't have nothing to give you a few of this half. You can buy anything you want for nothing. The man who was on the king's right hand said, oh, if the Lord should open the window, the other boy got that big girl. But Elisha said, you'll see it, but you'll never either, because you have God. Word of God says that when the word was finally given, they went out and sent some more men out. They come out and said, it's true. We follow them all the way from the rivers and stuff scattered everywhere. We don't even see what whatever. He said, then let's go out. He told the guy that was his first in command. He said, you would have control of the gate. Let the people out a few at a time. They stomped him in the earth. He knew it, but he never tasted it. They walked on him. They stomped him in the ground. Killed him. And just like God had predicted, everything he did was there. Why? Because somebody refused to keep setting on the premises. Somebody refused to set him on the die. Somebody got up and made a decree and put some legs on that decree and began to march forth like a mighty army. God blessed it. God anointed it. God changed it. The circumstances changed instantly. They went from being hungry to full. They went from being paupers to rich. They went from being destitute to having everything their mind could even comprehend. That's what God will do for you, whatever your deed is. So that's setting on the premises. Let me go to the promises right quick. You know what good is a premise without a promise, right? Amen. The Word of God talks about promises. Nobody ever read Psalms 23. The Word of God says, put it up there, the Lord is my shepherd. He's who's shepherd? I thought he was mine. He's my shepherd. See, we've got to understand he's a personal shepherd. We look at so many times, see people being blessed and seem like everything they touch turns to gold, like gold miners touch, they talk about. We say, well, I don't know God don't do that for me. God don't need to do that for you, doesn't it? Or maybe you're in that place, God can't do that to you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He puts me in a position I should have no need of anything. If, in fact, by not needing anything, I'm going to calm in my spirit. You know, isn't it good to have a calmness about you? That everything I need, He's taken care of, He's supplying. He did it before, He'll do it again. I mean, He's God, he, He'll bankrupt hell if He has to. Talk about how He's been beside the still waters and He's been the green medicine of the world. He's leaving me in a place of plenty. He's leaving me in a place that I don't have to panic. He's leaving me in a place where I can just enjoy being who I am. I thought I enjoy life. I'm getting on that. I enjoy life, don't you? How many of us enjoy your life? Oh man, I, I tell you what, I sit the sun in the morning, I want to get up, ooh, what a beautiful day the Lord made. I like to get out, just, you know, even when it's raining. I don't like to get out in it, but I'll still look out the window and say, well, Lord send the rain to the surf for water. Ah, he's a good God. But the boys and flyers come. I know we went up to Georgia yesterday, had met with him, he's a he's a father. He said, I may be mad today, but I thought I saw some butterbeds. I said, no, you're not mad to think you're seeing some buttercups. I said, well, we're heading south. The time we got to where we was going, there was hundreds of them. Trees were done budded out. 
He said, well, no, I'm just back home. I said, you forget we live in the Northwest where it's still cold, but it's coming. It's coming. You know, it's kind of like it starts in the South and works its way up. Amen. And that's the way God is. God will start one heart and work to another heart and to another heart. And pretty soon he'll work in the whole church. Next thing you know, the whole church is on fire for the glory of God. We get hard of sitting on the premises. We're going to get up and do something. We're going to stand on the promises and declare thus said the word of God and redeem from all the things and corruption of life and enjoy who he is. He lives in the path of righteousness. I'm right standing with God. Not because of who I am, but because of who he wants to believe me. I don't know how to walk, but he knows how to believe me. And if I learn to follow him, no more people don't want to follow. Everybody wants to be in charge. We don't need no one in charge but God. We need to be in charge. Another part he talks about said, leave it through the matter of the shadow of death. You know, the power of shadow, you got a house of light. Amen. Amen. Even in death, he's there. Amen. It wouldn't be a shadow if it wasn't for light. Where the light comes from? The light comes from Jesus. And I'm telling you, he lights our path every day. It's kind of like that old song I heard one time, he lights up to my life. That's who he is this morning. Good no doubt about it. He says, in the midst of my enemies, he takes care of me. Hallelujah. He takes care of me in the midst of my troubles, in the midst of my problems, in the midst of my pain. He's always on my side. In the midst of my enemies, when they go to do me wrong, he's going to do me right. God is. He said, and I'll end up putting you in a place of goodness and mercy all the days of your life. You can dwell in my house forever. Oh, what a joy that is. Let me move on through this. I don't know what time it is. I ain't going to watch. Is that better than that one? I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. Hallelujah. Now, Isaiah 119, the word of God says, If we obey his commandments, this promise is not all about now, we will eat the good of the land. In Deuteronomy 28, 1, he says, We shall be blessed coming in. Best going out, if we hearken unto his voice, we're diligent to do what he said, obey his commandments and statutes, he said, we'll be blessed, we'll be blessed, we'll be blessed. I like being blessed. <laughs> I prefer blessings over aggravation. Be blessed. That means God's hand is going to be on you. Acts 17, 28, he said, in him, in him, who's him? God. In him we live and we move and we have our being. As certain also, as you courts have said, for we are also his offsprings. We are the sons and daughters of the living God of heaven. The great I am. In John 10, 10, the word of God, the latter part of it says, I preached last week about the thief going to kill seven stars. I don't know guess it last week. Can't remember. But I want to preach the last part. I want to tell you about the last part, the best part. Jesus said, but here's my promise. I come to give you life. And not only am I going to give you some life, I'm going to give you life for one that you can even comprehend to get a hold of. You've got to understand. You are blessed of God. You've got to understand. You're anointed and appointed for a time in which you live on planet earth. God just didn't stick you here to take up some space. God put you here to make a difference in the world in which you live to change it for the glory of God. He says in Psalms 1, 1 through 3, I thought this is always real good. Blessed is the man, or woman, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law will be meditated day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the river of water. That bringeth forth his fruit in the season, his leaves also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth in prosper. Promise from God. He says to us in 1 Corinthians 10 13. Now there is no temptation taken you, but since it's common unto them. Hallelujah. But God is faithful. God is faithful. I said, God is faithful. I may not always be faithful. But God is faithful. That's Him. That's His person. That's who He is. He is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted, but that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Get through it, in other words. That's who He is. That's a promise. Isaiah 40 and 31, He says, Unto you and I, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, not eagle, eagles. That's telling me that 
you know, if I, if I thought he'd use the word here, eagle, he'd do it one time, but he's an eagle, he'd tell me time and time and time again. Whatever I need, he said, if I would just simply do what he asked me to do, wait upon him, he said, you'll be doing your strength as a form of weeds of evil. You will run and not be weary. You'll walk and not faint. Amen. You ever felt like fainting sometimes? You ever got weary? Sit down and say, oh my God, I don't think he will do that not. But God is faithful. He will never let you fail. Finishing this morning, Second Corinthians 1.20. Thank you, Lord. Above all I've said, remember this one. This puts it all together. For all the promises of God, in Him are ye, and in Him, Amen. Unto the glory of God by us. Everything in this book, there's over 3,000 actual promises, I think it is, in this Bible. Everyone of yours. <coughs> If God said it, it's real. It's true. Let all men be liars, but let God be true. But he said, in all these things, it's yea and amen. Meaning, word amen and so be it. It's the truth, so be it. What God has said, God still means. If he told you something the first day you got saved, you may have been saved for 50 years, but he still means the same thing today. He still has the same expectancy. He still expects us to live the same way we need to live before Him. Not do what we want to do, but do what He says. Not worrying about just sitting down, holding arms, saying, well, okay, I'm here. Now what's going to happen? But get up and march to the enemy's camp. Run them off. And take back that which the enemy has taken to you. That's the promise of God this morning. He loves you. He loves me. He's going to help us. In these last days, last hours, I believe we're preparing for the coming of Jesus. You're going to start seeing the Spirit of God poured out like you've never seen it before. Things are going to change. We're going to see the gospel preached. Lives are going to be changed. People are going to be saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. Demons are going to come out. All kinds of things will happen. And it's not what we're doing. You know, it's not what we're going to do. It's what He's going to do. Because He said, I'm coming after a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Well, we got a little work to do, man. And we be honest, we got some, we got to put some things under the blood. But he loves us and he's going to help us. Why? Because he's an awesome God. So let me ask you, are you standing on the promises or are you just deciding to sell them?